Check, baby check, baby one, two. I'm the worst at hosting things, so I'm just gonna be very awkward. <laughs> Me and, too. <laughs> and say, hello and welcome to <laughs> episode two. Are we maybe? episode two? <laughs> of the art cast. Uh, this is a different... This is kind podcast. of like a side podcast. Or Look maybe at you. you just started podcasting, you already have two. <laughs> <laughs> I two know. different podcasts. It's pretty wild. Maybe you need a third and a fourth one. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> Every few weeks the, you have a new podcast. They're all going to the same place though, which is my YouTube channel. Maybe we should take two on that intro. I felt really bad about that one. <laughs> two hours later. I want to do a better intro first, so I'm just going to say... I like the intro. Hello that. and welcome to ArtCast <laughs> with Dylan and Roger. <laughs> Roger Buttles, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> got to have you walk in from a... <laughs> And then everyone claps, and I'm wearing like a suit, like a. <laughs> you are wearing a suit, <laughs> not a real suit. Like you know, people dress crazy. on the price is right. So, Roger, what is the price of <laughs> this, <laughs> this frog? <laughs> the frog, seven ninety nine. <laughs> ten dollars. Ten dollars. You busted. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> That's okay. You can handle it. Uh, but anyway, so that was the intro. Now we have to record the outro. What were you, what were you going to say? You <laughs> said like the, uh, the Axl Rose foam microphones. Remember he used to have the big foam? What around. color were his? I think his were like orange or yellow or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is like a classic like foam device for microphones. I see them in all sorts of colors. Um, Axl Rose. We're going to be discussing Guns N' Roses <laughs> today to for an about, hour and a half. I have nothing else to say about that. Uh, well, I think there's definitely like a physical presence of people when they walk in a room too. That's that like you can't deny. separate separate from their actual like physical size, right? Like both. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I think sometimes like. Yeah, I don't know. It's a different subject, I guess. But yeah, like that's what I was trying to say about you earlier when we were at the museums. Like you, <laughs> or like when you like order a cup of coffee or, or in a restaurant, like you have that charisma about oh. you. <laughs> I don't know about that. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, or maybe it's just I was shocked to hear you say that you used to be very shy, like because you really? you seem like one of the least shy people I can think of. But uh, I get it because you're like, you have empathy for those that are shy. And I think that's how we like became such good friends is that you understood that I'm pretty reserved. Yeah. But you like saw what we have in common regardless. And, uh, totally. Yeah. I was really, really, really shy as a kid. I think I had, I had three older siblings who were all really loud and outgoing and, mm. So my earliest memories are just like sitting at the dining dining room table, the dinner table, just not saying anything as they were like screaming and just couldn't stop talking. And maybe that's where we we get that kinship from. We were both the youngest. Yeah, I was just of two siblings, but I, yeah. I always felt like the quiet, yeah, baby of the family too. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's different when But then as you get three. older, I think you get less shy in a way. Maybe mm -hmm. you become more, a little more comfortable in yourself. I don't know. Yeah, that definitely was true for me. I had to, like, I found my voice and started to have confidence that I, like, had something to say sometimes. Not yeah. always. <laughs> yeah. But it used to be such a, like, a, a hurdle to overcome to even, like, say something at a even just hanging out with friends or like much less in a school art school critique or mm -hmm. something i was like dead silent most of the time because i was afraid that if i start talking it would it wouldn't come out or yeah um yeah 
So I'm glad I got over that with, at first, lots of self-medication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> this stuff. Yeah. Or, like, just ways to alter my consciousness to get out of my, the habits the and, yeah, the, the lifestyle I had committed myself to. Was that was that a good enough intro? Should we do it again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just the part where I say because uh, I didn't even introduce you yet. I, oh yeah. Okay. I here here that. we go. I gotta take a deep breath and put on my presenter <laughs> cap. Which well, we can edit all this out, right? We we can. Oh yeah, I I will definitely edit anything that I definitely is wasn't awkward. Like, thinking we were going to talk about Guns and Roses. <laughs> <laughs> this is Roger Buttles, an artist <laughs> from the east coast (laughs) flying into chicago for a a show at a legendary apartment gallery the carl in pilsen though that by the time you're hearing this you might this will probably be a couple weeks from now when i edit and post this on youtube but uh, maybe we'll have some pictures of the show in the in oh, the cool. YouTube video. I usually like inset some photos. Oh, nice. So if they're artists we discuss or your work or my work, we can put it on the screen. Um, but that thank you great. for uh, joining me. Yeah, thanks for this. having me. No, this is great. My first podcast interview. <laughs> <laughs> the way you just said podcast like sums up everything I love about your your accent and your tone of voice. It's just <laughs> something very endearing and like adorable about it. My first podcast. <laughs> That's my uh, Long Island uh, voice. <laughs> my <Yeah>. roots. <laughs> so, uh, born in Long Island. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I won't force you to give a whole biography. Maybe we can put it in the description or something. Oh, but, yeah. Well, I do want to ask how, like, you got into art and, um, yeah, and that kind of thing. I, well, I was, as a little kid, I was just like every other little kid, I feel like, who just naturally want to draw and paint. I see that with my daughters now all the time. Like, they're always drawing. I think there's something about, like, childhood and creativity of a way of just expressing yourself and understanding the world around you through mark making like drawing and i think there's also a bit of as a kid you're always being told what you can and cannot do you know um by your parents or teachers or school or whatnot even before then and so art was is a way of doing what you want to do it's like freedom as a kid i think there's something that happens with little kids like subconsciously where they can feel like total freedom with art making so i always felt like that as a little kid and when i i still remember as a kid when i because i was really shy when i would go to nursery school i would just go in the corner to the easel and just like draw and paint and i really wouldn't socialize with anyone and i would cry a lot and the teacher would have to send me home a lot of times and uh, my siblings still tease me to this day that i failed nursery school because i had to do it two years in a row (laughs) because i like couldn't handle it not like you were held back no no. (laughs) it was more social anxiety like i wasn't ready for the social interaction of like regular school i guess Um, even with three older siblings like well, I guess stranger kids that you didn't know, like that was more uncomfortable. Than yeah, because this is really fact I was really shy as a kid. Mm-hmm. I was really shy. And I, would you, you said you would go and draw and paint in that school? Yeah. Instead of interacting. That yeah. was your kind of outlet. Yeah, I remember that. Sense. I really remember loving the color red too as a kid because it was so intense. Um, is this that was always you my favorite color. Drew Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. poster. Like, I gotta, you gotta send yeah. me that photo. I yeah. can put it put it on the screen. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of those. Yeah, exactly. Maybe uh, that was even a little later. That looked like a more sophisticated. A maybe like six or seven. Yeah, maybe I was about that age. But, I don't know. Could have been. Um, your your girls are almost six, right? Yeah, so, and they their drawings are getting very sophisticated. Yeah, like, totally. Uh, would you say their style is similar to yours at that their age? 
I think I own Eve. Um, maybe a little more so. Una, my other daughter, they're twins. Um, has like a little more refined style to her, I think. It's a little more controlled, and Ioni's maybe a little more me free, looser. Um, but I think that naturally happens, too, as kids develop. They get more refined because they learn what things are supposed to look like. Yeah. You know, and they try to make it look more accurate, so... Can we can we go deeper into this idea of like the freedom of art at that age? Because yeah. that's different from how I would describe it. Like you feel like a child because you're like set in this box of being a kid and your parents and your teachers and whoever, they give you rules that you have to follow. So drawing is like an outlet for freedom. Um, that's kind of how I thought of it as a little kid. And that would make sense with you having like a looser like style, not really following conventions of drawing, just like playing with color and like, yeah. getting to red. Yeah, like I look at my daughter's work and I, I see how they make work and it's it's so intuitive. There's no yeah. there's no like second guessing. Occasionally one of my daughters kind of cries when she doesn't get things quote unquote right, you know? But like Una, more, Una yeah. But more or less it's just like they just do it. And then they say like, "Oh, that that's a penguin, or that's a that's a crab." Like I was showing you the other night. Like, and things just in their mind make perfect sense. Um, but as a viewer, you don't know it's a, it's abstracted, you know. Um, I bet having kids and now seeing them start to make art has like put you in touch again with like how you felt at that age. I'm totally, just, I'm just and being guessing. a parent. Like, and, I like, all the art to... that I'm making now is really, it's all based on my kids mm -hmm. and, like, what it means to be a parent now as an artist and raising kids and having all those responsibilities, but then also seeing um, seeing how they think about the world, too, and, like, incorporating that into the, the art. Because it, it has... I think having having kids, and I'm sure most people feel this way, makes you remember what it was like to be a kid. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah, because I have no, I can't really put myself in that mindset of like when I was five or whatever, like drawing for the first time. I know I did it a lot, but that's why I was asking about freedom because I don't think it was necessarily freedom that made me do it so much. It, if anything, it was like control over <laughs> mm. something or like feeling like um fulfilled to have like made something like the the pride of like i can make this look yeah. like a for some reason the thing that sticks in my head is a drawing of camcorder that i drew and i had to go like hang out at one of my sister's dance classes someone had a camcorder and i just like drew it in my oh, sketchbook awesome. yeah and uh <laughs> and getting like praised by like my mom or yeah I think even the parent who owned the camcorder was like, wow, your little kid drew that camcorder in like all the details of the That's amazing. machinery. Do you and still have the drawing? It might be in like a sketchbook at my mom's house yeah. somewhere. I should, I should go look it up and, <laughs> and take a picture of it for this. But uh, I might've been a little older too, maybe six or seven. Yeah. But it was like that feeling of like having made something that wasn't there before which there's freedom in that for sure, but it's like I never really felt constricted or confined. I always pretty much followed rules and didn't feel the need to rebel. I pretty much never until maybe like yeah. late teens. Like it, yeah, um, yeah. But there is definitely that element of pride after making an artwork. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that goes away. Like no. after, I mean, right? Like don't you feel, even if no one else likes it, like I mean, even if everyone else hates it after you make it, like Hopefully. you still feel a sense of like pride. Like I did that; that didn't exist before, and I put that in out into the world. I think you, it should be. I think it, artists <laughs> should strive for that. Maybe a lot of a lot of times we don't, or I definitely make art sometimes where I'm not happy with it. But those don't really see the light of day, or like I don't right. show them to anyone. 
Yeah, I mean, there's still like criticality that. involved too. But when you do something that you like, there's a sense of pride. I see that with my kids too. They're so excited to show me their art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that puts a lot of responsibility on as a parent, like how to look at their work and respond to it. <laughs> Critique them. <constructively. laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the Maybe proportions are wrong, but... <laughs> um, mm. I was going to say, uh, as you get to be an adult artist and like doing this thing that comes so naturally to kids, like striving for that freedom and even that like feeling of pride when you do something good like it gets harder and harder to access i i feel like like i have to like trick myself into feeling free in the studio which is kind of a bummer that i can't just do it naturally yeah to go back i never had any formal training in Mm -hmm. in drawing or painting for years until my early 20s so when I st- started making work again in my early 20s, I, um, I kind of picked up with this similar sort of mentality of like limitations within technical abilities, but then also like a sense of this is something that's freeing. Yeah. So whenever I'm disappointed with my work, feel like it's because I put too many constraints on myself or heard too many outside voices and lost that sense of freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that actually seems very like a very healthy mindset to approach art, <laughs> like without just coming into a, basically with the unchanged mindset of a child making art, because you yeah. haven't spent the last 10, 12 years like being trained in what art should be. And, right. Like, yeah. Because they always say, like, when you get out of art school, especially, like, grad school, you kind of have to unlearn a lot of that, like, yeah. dogma so you can get back to the freedom thing. Totally. It's great to have all the technical skills along the way. So if you can pick those up but not let it change your mentality. Yeah. It's the best case scenario, I think. Yeah. Knowing what to learn and what to forget is always seemed like an important mm-hmm. You didn't take any art classes in undergrad, like drawing photography. And stuff, just photography? Yeah. And like darkroom style and everything? Yeah. Yeah. And some photo history. Um, and then after college, I started taking some adult educate, education, um, drawing and painting classes at um, CCAC, California College of Arts and Craft, and mm-hmm. San Francisco Art Institute, and in um, the Bay Area, I was taking drawing, like nighttime drawing and painting, and oh wow, then paint, you know, doing work on my own. So just to get the foundation, yeah, you know, I didn't but, realize you took like those adult classes. Yeah, for a couple of years, and then I also worked with a mentor, this woman Eleanor Kent, who was she was a student of Elmer Bischoff back in like the fifties, the Bay Area figurative movement. So when I started working with Eleanor. She, I was like 24 and she was seven. I want to say she was like 75 or something like that. I can't, I don't know exactly how old she was, but so I used to go over to her house on Sunday morning and we would draw and paint <laughs> together. Nice. And so I kind of had this very like informal training from her and then, you know, continuing ed classes and just making work constantly. I was working in a frame shop and a gallery. And just constantly going to art shows in the in the Bay Area and learning more and more, discovering things on my own, but not from like a uh, very traditional perspective, I guess. Did those that like mentor and uh, the drawing and painting classes you took? Do you do you still think of those lessons a lot when you work, like how to mix color and draw a certain way? Like, do you think it? really stuck with you those lessons um the attitude of how to make work from eleanor was really helpful um Mm -hmm. she was very like uh, liberating in her approach um so i don't think about like mixing color because i just do that now just i just mix how i mix i don't think like uh, 
Um, was she a, a more abstract painter? Like very figurative. Oh, okay. Yeah, but she wasn't known outside of the Bay Area. But that but, scene, the Bay Area figurative scene, that's Bischoff was part of that, right? Yeah. And like... And like Nathan David Oliveira Park, and Lobdell yeah. and Deep in Corn and Park mm-hmm. and all that. But they were old, They were older than her. She, yeah, I They figured. were like her teachers. They were her teachers, kind of. Right. So, she was good friends with uh, Ruth Asawa. Do you know um, her? I don't know her. Sorry, you should check her out. She, she also a Bay Area figurative. She was, yeah. She There's was a great like, book fin- of them <laughs> that I used to... One of my painting teachers had a big book of Bay Area figurative painters. I would, I would just love flipping through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some great work in that scene. And then I think also like the whole mission school movement definitely influenced me too. With like Chris Johansson and Alicia yeah. McCarthy and some of those artists just like they were all self-taught, <laughs> you know, very loose from free and colorful and bright, abstract, but also figures and... Just so like, like got raw. a street art influence too. Was that part of the no, mission? School? I wasn't really in, no, I didn't really know much about the street art or okay. like graffiti, I, but Chris Johansson was never involved in the graffiti thing. I don't know if he was doing graffiti, I don't think so, okay. but he was using a lot of like found material, I believe. So, all right. Uh, <laughs> they were leaning your head on a giant bass headstock. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this but. is a very fascinating conversation. The idea of like the child mentality versus us as trained artists. Yeah. Because there's a jump ahead and we you went to art school. That's how we met. That's totally. how I see uh, MFA program, which but is, you were taking a lot of drawing classes throughout your like formative years and growing yeah. up, right? Well, I wouldn't say like an unusual amount. I took a couple classes. Uh, did we talk about this yesterday or something? Was I telling you about, yeah, how my dad taught yeah. at SCIC so he could get me and my sister like a free class? And it was usually in the summers we would take a drawing and painting class for, for middle schoolers. We did those a few times when I was like between 10 and 13, but after that, I just took like, I always chose to take art as my elective in yeah. high school, and it was just pretty basic public school art classes that I just happened to like really devote a lot of time and attention to, um, and then I went to art school for undergrad. Right. But I kind of always knew what I wanted to to do was just to like get really good at the technical side of mm-hmm. figure painting and painting and you in general. Did it. <laughs> I, You're doing yes, it. I did it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't much for me to like have to unlearn because it was all, maybe there actually is. And I just haven't successfully unlearned the things that are shackling me yet. Mm. And I, I, there's, cause what I was saying about trying to be more free in the studio, that's a constant struggle. Like I always have voices in my head saying like, this isn't, this isn't right, or like, yeah. I have to, th- I have to, but my favorite pieces I've ever made were totally spontaneous, just like yeah, yeah, yeah. letting my intuition run wild, and those are my favorite things. Totally, yeah. So I have to. There's tap a lot into to be that. said for that. Yeah, children are like the wisest people. <laughs> yeah, they just don't have a lot of like experience and technical skills and <laughs> and whatnot. But in terms of mindset, like it's so, they're so advanced. I think there's a lot to be said for intu- intuitive decision making in art. Yeah. That's what naturally comes to you because that's, I think, where your voice really is. It's, it's like beneath all the waves of the noise and like lower down. Like I was think of the analogy of like a scuba diver. When you're on the surface of the ocean, there's so much waves and noise, chaos, and then you go down under the water, and everything becomes very calm and peaceful. And mm. I kind of think that I think about that in the studio sometimes. Like, Ooh. how many voices are in my head right now telling me what I'm doing wrong, and then <laughs> losing those voices. I remember yeah. when I worked with Bill O'Brien in school, he gave me 
remember he said to me something, I forget exactly what, but it was basically like, you know, you do a lot of really weird, interesting things when you just very naturally to you. And then he said, but then you go back and you quote unquote, like correct them. And then he said, he said, and, and that ruins all, all the work. Like, cause you're taking out the intuitive things that come naturally to you and trying to make it look how it's supposed to look. And he's like, you should leave those parts. And that kind of stuck with me. Yeah. Um, That's a great quote or like memory from your advising. Yeah. It's Ooh. funny cause you get so many voices and so much advice and critique in school and then you kind of just remember select little snippets and that, totally. those are the ones that stay with you. <laughs> and and they're the kind of things that probably if you like talk to that teacher again and said like, I remember you said this to yeah. me, they would probably not even yeah. remember. It's just totally. a casual comment they said <laughs> totally. that was exactly what you needed at that moment yeah. or, or just stuck with you for some reason. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I love those little like memories of advice that, that just you always carry with you. Yeah. Um, that scuba diver like thing is really interesting. Like, can you elaborate that on, uh, on that a little, like you're in the studio and you have all that noise, but when you, you can, how do you go deep to like get to the quiet, peaceful part? Does it take work or like meditation to, or something? Meditation will help. Yeah. But, um, getting lost in music I find while I work is helpful. Hmm. I'm trying to remind myself that my hand is smarter than my, my mind. You know, like my hand, let my hand just do things yeah. without letting my mind tell it what to do. Or you can think about like a sports analogy too. You know, like if if someone's like, I don't know, like playing in a basketball game, you can't think, oh, I'm going to dribble here and then I'm going to go fast there and and pump fake and then take a shot you know you can't like consciously think all these things out you just have to react spontaneously and go do what you do on the basketball court and i yeah. think there's some kind of like that with painting and art making too like how much thinking can go into it i mean i think you need to not you just anyone helps if like you go spontaneously intuitively making work and then you can step back and like think critically about it. Like then you have your time out and mm -hmm. like look at what, what's going on. Okay, how yeah. do I respond to that and react and then go out again? So um, I saw a great quote plastered on the room I teach figure drawing in that was a great way of putting that where like making and critiquing are, are two separate processes. Yeah. Like you should never combine them basically. Yeah. Like do the do the judging thing. When you're not making. Totally. Like, you feel that when you make music, too. I'm assuming it's the same exact way, right? Like, you can't think yeah. consciously, like, I'm going to strum this note and that note and then move my finger. Like, like you couldn't, your muscle memory just has to kick in. Yeah. There, when you start doing that, you know, it's it's kind of it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. But no one really tells you that when you're learning when you're learning to draw and when you're learning to like play an instrument or something no one really explains this part to you like to to really play or make art at a high level you you have to like it's a state of flow that like you can't really teach you can tell people about it and like <laughs> encourage them to access it but there's no real like shortcut you can't intellectualize it you just yeah. have to do it I think there's a lot of similarities between like music, visual art, and for me, sports. I played a lot of sports growing up. Mm -hmm. This this idea that you learn the fundamentals, whether it's like notes on a guitar or strumming patterns, or you know, skills of like how to shoot a basketball or whatever sport you're playing, how to hit a baseball. You know, the technical skills of like swinging about. You got to learn those fundamentals. But then once you learn them. You can't think about them. Yeah. You just do them. So it's just muscle memory and like drowning out all the outside noise. So I do, I do think meditation's helpful. This is like, I think, really good stuff about uh, the nature of creativity and stuff. Yeah. Jeez. I love that. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> 
just made it way worse by like mentioning the eye contact while choosing. I thing. know. Now <laughs> I never neither of us are going to be able to. You really never never heard someone say like you got to make eye contact when you choose, or is it take a shot? Is that only for taking a shot? I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was for like shaking hands. Oh. You're supposed to make eye contact shaking hands. That's I've never it. thought about making eye contact when cheersing. Okay. Maybe I just like misheard something. Because <laughs> like, yeah, eye contact was never my strong suit. Still yeah. like not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's like someone I know well. Yeah. But even then I have to like look away a lot to just reset my totally social battery. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. I shouldn't even mention these things because now we just aren't going to be able to <laughs> not think about it. <laughs> about like the freedom of the studio, something that always is on my mind and it kind of prevents me from being free is like the materials. Like mm. they, they cost money. They're finite. And I don't just mean like, I don't mind spending money to prepare new canvases and like the paint itself isn't that expensive, but I go through a lot of labor preparing like oil grounds. Yeah. And I have like a few nicely prepared surfaces ready to go and this is kind of my own fault i developed a way of working that like requires me to start on that white oil ground and like remove mm -hmm. the highlights and like i rely on the oil ground to make my work so i kind of get one shot at a good image and if it if it fails i have to like uh, pretty much oil ground over it because then you don't have the oil ground exposed anymore yeah I see. So I've like limited myself. The results when it works, I really love more so than when I worked more conventionally. So it intensifies things. It does. I still I still know that freedom and intuition is the answer, but it's harder. I have more that's another voice in my head. That's like interesting. The waste of materials is always like a, yeah, a, another stressor. But it really shouldn't be, and I should actually be more comfortable with like rolling with things I don't like and learning how to fix them because that's definitely a good skill too. Do you, when you're making your work, if something goes quote unquote wrong, do you fix it and then carry on or do you carry on and then look back at the work? Because the reason I ask this is because I got into this horrible habit in grad school when something would quote unquote go wrong and I would spend time obsessing over the thing that was wrong trying to fix it fix it fix it and then carry on and um that like um spontaneity was gone then and i realized paintings were taking me way longer than they used to because i was being so self-critical during the process mm -hmm. and i kind of undid that and then i would realize if i didn't fix the quote-unquote mistake and I just kept working. And by the end of the painting, I no longer saw that as a mistake. It totally, totally worked within the whole context of the painting. So when you make your work, because you have this added pressure, like the oil ground exposure, do you um, like over critique yourself if something goes what you see is wrong? Or do you just like yeah. keep working on it? Well, to me, like keep working on it or is like, the correction of little minute errors and like I noticed so many times exactly what you're saying like the little mistakes they're not just okay they're usually like better than the things that I like have fixed and, mm -hmm. and made better so it like goes back to what Bill O'Brien said too like not to fix the the errors and or like the parts that are just your intuition yeah uh, it's so hard to recognize that. Like, I just started filming myself painting a lot over the summer. I was just, like, trying to make time-lapse videos of me working. Mm -hmm. And I would watch it back and see mm. a moment, like, halfway through the video. Where I'm like, oh, it looks so good there. And I'll keep watching. And I'll realize I, like, totally ruin it. And, like, and I don't realize I'm doing it. I'm ruining yeah. it at the time. I think I'm making it better. But there was a place where it's, like, really nice. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, my big thing I think I need to work on is, like, recognizing that moment when it happens and, and stopping. Age-old artist problem, Isn't like that, stopping. It's so, it's so interesting because, yeah, it's an age-old artist problem, but now there's this technology where you could film yourself working and be able to pause time yeah. and look at that instant or the, those moments that 
where things changed in the work and then think, oh, like have some insight into your process that you yeah. might not be able to have. Like you're essentially looking, you're like separating yourself from yourself, watching yourself work, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, it's a little weird, but it yeah, totally is. It's like studying film of yourself <laughs> or something. For sports. Yeah. yeah. That's, did, you, uh, did you have to do that in, uh, when you played Sometimes. lacrosse? <laughs> yeah. You would watch your, your coach Sometimes, yeah. Like I'm sure like pitchers do this all the time. They watch their, you know, they film themselves pitching and then watch their mechanics and how to fix it. Wow. You know? Um, yeah, that's... That's such a weird contradiction of the whole like artists need to just follow your intuition because it's true that when you're in the moment doing the thing, you have to be totally free and not thinking. But that analysis part is also important to like step step back and see like what you want to change and yeah. how you want to improve. Yeah. You can't just be like willy nilly doing whatever comes to mind forever. Like you, there are artists who do that, but... Right. You're also striving for something specific, maybe. I think there's a difference between, like, um, freedom and spontaneity and just, like, carefreeness or, like, not work. You know, I'm not saying everyone should just work spontaneously and everything should just be completely loose because there are certain artists who need to be very refined in order for their work to be what they need it to be. Mm-hmm. But so I can only speak like mostly for, for myself, you know. Um, yeah, there's like so we went to the accounts. Bridget Riley show yesterday of the drawings. Like she can't just be spontaneous and intuitive and loose. There needs to be a lot of planning in her work, and it's mm-hmm. amazing. That's her practice. Like teach their own. They have their own practice that has to work for them. But I wonder if there's some part of her planning those things where she gets like that flash of inspiration, like mm-hmm. this optical effect she wants to create, and like how how trippy would it be if these ribbons of teal and pink yeah. changed color, and and that's like the impulse that gets her to slow down and do all the planning and labor involved. Yeah, yeah. That's, there's the yeah. uh, the left and the right part of the brain going yeah. into the process. Like for some people, the right side plays more of a role, and for some people, the left side plays more of a role. The I always get them confused because like the handedness like is reverse, right? Your left side yeah, yeah. controls your right hand, yeah. and your right half controls your left hand. But the right half is more creative, right? The creative, free yeah. fall, flowing side. Yes, left is more analytical. Left is more analytical, I believe. More like math, science, formula, perspective, mm-hmm. right? It's more creative. Yeah, that's interesting because most artists are like using a combination of them. But yeah, what what's the ratio of? Yeah, or like going back and forth, or using certain parts of your brain for certain parts of the artwork, and then other parts. You know, like some parts need to be more planned or laid out or mm-hmm. thought through, and then other parts need to just be looser, and they work together. Yeah. The watching film <laughs> analogy, I, that's going to stick with me. I love that idea. Because I've never played sports yeah. uh, to any degree of competency, so I never had to watch film of myself. Yeah. I'd imagine I, I would cringe so hard. <laughs> Well, you're doing it with painting, though. Yeah, I'm doing it with painting. <laughs> Do you cringe? I cringe when I lose that moment where I think it looks great and it looks nothing like that by the end of my like hour-long video clip. Yeah, uh, like just watching it and fast forward. But and the fact that like that version of the painting will never exist again. Right. I kept going. The old ground is dried, or like the paint is dried. It's not. It's not going to be the same ever. Mm-hmm. But I, I know. I guess I could like think about it in the next one. There was this uh, this show at the Met a few years ago with um, I don't know if it was uh, Matisse. It was in the base in the uh, lower level, and it was the I think it's called like the pink nude or something like that. The woman she's on like the side of the she's in the bath. 
with the blue tiles. Hmm. I don't know if you, you can put it on your yeah, uh, I'll put it in there in podcast. But anyway, what he did was he painted like thirty two paintings or something like that, and he would just paint over it and paint over it and paint over it. But each one he would take a photo of it. So there, there was this grid of the photos, and you could see like the different possibilities of what the piece was, and each one would have been a great painting of on, in and of itself. Yeah. But it just wasn't exactly what he wanted. But so um, when he eventually got what he wanted, that was what the piece ended up being. But it's um, it's interesting to think that where would, if if you were making the paintings, like, would you have stopped on, like, number seven or number 14? Which one would have spoken to you? And that's how it is with all of our art, right? Like, where do we stop? Where do we go? Yeah. Everyone sees it differently. I think it's rarely like the ideal place. <laughs> like it's always a compromise. Like you get to a certain spot where your like motivation runs out or yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good enough, but yeah. it might not it might fall short of something in your head, but there's the beauty in that of just accepting like this is what it is. Totally. No one else could have made this, so it is like it has some merit. It's like mm-hmm. a thing. It, the ideal of what it could be like that is kind of irrelevant i feel like or does it say like what you want it to say which like i never know what i want to say until i'm done basically yeah <laughs> i know there's a abstract like aesthetic ideal i'm striving towards like trying to push it in a direction i like but as far as like subject matter that always comes later for me mm-hmm. in in my favorite work i used to try to plan it out like I want a piece that is about this topic, and mm. then I like, and then it always falls flat to me. To me, or it f- I get bored working on it very quickly. But going in and just making image, like making an image without a plan, having some like random chance thrown in to like throw some some left turns into it, like I get to be like surprised by the outcome. Yeah, and I can analyze it myself. I like, can think about it, which is fun. Yeah. What about you? Do you like when you pick an image, you're using like you're sketching and, and using source images or like do you have a plan in, in, vol- in mind for what it's going to be about? Yes and no. Sometimes I work differently. Sometimes I'll work from like a source material or a photograph I've taken and I want to incorporate that into the image or that is going to be the image. And then other times I'm working more intuitively like um normally whenever it's like a a landscape type painting there's I'm not working from any image or even any drawing I'm just going for it mm-hmm. but then if there's a figure involved or like a specific scene then I'll normally work from a source material okay. um so a lot of your landscape and like nature stuff is just fully like drawn or painted from your mind with yeah. no no plan or sketching involved you just start on yeah. the final surface yeah that makes sense i can kind of see how like they're they're looser and like they seem to have like their own logic to them or like yeah because flow. with the landscape it's more about creating a like a dreamlike atmosphere that's distorting s- space yeah. um so if there was too much planning, I think that could be that could be lost. But I want there to be a sense a lot of the time I felt a sense of like a floating, like you're you're there's not a ground you're on, but you're like looking down at the space. Mm-hmm. Um like a dreamlike kind of a sense of unease in the piece because I I want that to exist with the landscapes because a lot of about a lot of the landscape work is about human uh, impact on the environment. So by having it disorienting, I kind of feel like that's how I feel about what we're doing to yeah. the environment. It's it's uneasy. So uh, is, is that always the effect you're seeking when you do things that are like spatially impossible? Like are you trying to to show disorder and and unease unease yeah um and a lack of control you know in like your dreams you can't 
really control things. Yeah. You can experience things, but you can't really control it. And that's kind of how I feel. I mean, I think that's how probably a lot of people feel in this day and age about the -hmm. planet. You know, you want to do the right thing and make the right decisions, but you also feel like powerless in a lot of ways or you shouldn't, but you do. Yeah. Um, so, um, the landscapes, none of, I don't use any source material and it's, um, the concepts are also involving, we're doing, we're doing things to the environment, but there's a memory and the environment's going to starting to do things back to us. We think of ourselves as being in control, but really like the earth is in control. And unfortunately that's going to be frightening over the next, you know, 50 years or whatnot. The earth is in control or are we, have we just gone so far in our effect on the earth that it's just a snowball rolling down, turning into an avalanche that I think whatever like we do to the earth, the earth is going to do back to us like a karmic kind of way. Whoa. You know, so like <laughs> we create, you know, we raise the temperature of the planet. The planet's going to respond. <laughs> you know, so like what goes around comes around in a way, you know, if we, so that's, that's where the unease is in the work. Because like, mm-hmm. we're doing certain things to the earth, but the earth is going to do certain things back. It's going to respond back. Not, not maliciously or benevolently, but just matter of factly. Yeah, the earth doesn't really have f- feelings. Yeah. <laughs> well, I probably shouldn't say that. It could, it could very yeah. well. But what, or motivations, it's just a bunch of reactions and factors like affecting each other and reverberating yeah. millions and trillions of times. <laughs> yeah, so you can't... So, like, to make a painting about that interaction between humans and the environment and the environment and humans, it's not really something you can plan out, per se. That no. that has to be expressed, like, um, like, ethereally or, like, you know, very... Um, like spiritually almost, or, you know, there's a abstraction to it. But if I'm making a painting that has like one of my daughters in it, I need a a source material to work from to answer your question. If that answered your question. Yeah, it, it does. And it kind of reminds me that you have so many like bodies of work, like, and I was telling you last night that I, I think you have a very recognizable style through all of it, but you've like explored so many, themes and and like ways of working like combining lots of like diagrammatic like yeah. mathematical <laughs> imagery and like symbols with uh yeah with landscapes and figures and and this like spiritual stuff like you you've really done all, done it all <laughs> yeah <laughs> like in terms of subject matter <laughs> and the Im- image uh like source material I think the one thereof. thing that kind of connects it all is like my feelings, my th- thought about space, space, mm-hmm. space, um, spatial patterns or like disorienting space. That seems to be like a theme that keeps coming back into my work, whether they're like the big scroll drawings I did at your space or my paintings. It's always about disorienting space that that seems to be like a recurring thing that comes into the work. Yeah. To, and to bring up like the show at MySpace, uh, MySpace.com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it was called Sight Red, but you had oh, Our Only Day was the name of your exhibition. Mm-hmm. And there was lots of spatial disorientation within the scrolls themselves, but even yeah. how you laid it out we like made almost like a maze or yeah of like these intersecting banners that sort of like had back and front sides and you totally. could like walk around um and lately you've been working more like singular paintings on stretched canvas yeah uh but does do you ever think of 
messing around with like the presentation in a spatially disorienting way because I yeah, think that well, was kind of disorienting. I mean, those works had a lot to deal with fragility and and life, and um, a lot of it had to do with loss of life at a very young age, and this idea of like pregnancy and birth and life and death and just the fr- fragility of that time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's why a lot of those works were works on paper and fabric. They're, you know, dyed, hand-dyed fabrics, and they were very fragile pieces, as you know. And then I had that horrible studio flood when all those works got destroyed. <laughs> and ironically. Um, kind of like fitting full circle of that yeah. series. And so after that happened, I just psychologically, emotionally needed to stop working with material that was so fragile for a while. And I was just, yeah. I said, I'm just going to go back to making paintings on campus really straightforward. And if, yeah, <laughs> if yeah. there's a, another studio flood, they'll probably survive. They'll survive. Yeah. <laughs> but that, but w- the original idea of um, working on like long, narrow, scrolls was a way of um, further disorienting space because if if there were more rectangular pieces, you could lay out the, con- the information in the piece in a more realistic manner. But if you were like to stretch something out and mm-hmm. put the same information in that piece, well, then it just naturally becomes disorienting. Um, so I was really into that concept, um, of like disorienting space simply through the size of the, the, uh, artwork that I chose to work on. Yeah. I still love that series. Thank you. <laughs> it was, and it was a beautiful show. Uh, the fact that it, none of that work exists anymore. It's like all the more like it's, it's so painful to to realize that like you can't ever like show those again or yeah or, like sell them or or anything that people do with art we make like which is so funny. Just display them again but yeah at least we had that one like opportunity i'm so to thankful share. to you that we did you know because they're gone and it was funny and not funny but it was ironic because a lot of the work had to deal with impermanence like the impermanence of life and like really appreciating things while you have them because you never know when something's going to be taken away yeah and that happened to all that work so but i'm so thankful to you that we got to show them before they did Mm -hmm. and i can revisit the themes and maybe i could see myself going back and working on more scrolls down the road but Maybe they'll be like scrolls on canvas instead of paper. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I have talked a lot over the years, too. So it just feels like we're just hanging out talking. Yeah. It was really nice going to the museum with you yesterday, too. Yeah, that was really fun. Um, it's so funny because I think about you a good amount when I go when I go to the Met or when I'm like been to like the Louvre or the Prada or like yesterday at the art Institute, because I, I was like hold you to such a high standard when it comes to like technical capabilities, you know, what you're able to do technically your proficiency is so unbelievable. And so when I look at like Rubens or, you know, like Botticelli or someone, I, I would think like, who do I know? Like, that's capable of making paintings like this today. And there really aren't a lot of artists out there that have the technical facility. I I mean, who can make like Renaissance type paintings today. I think there was, there was a, um, I think Hockney spoke about this once, how he said about the three things you need for making great artwork, your eye, your hand. And I think he, I can't remember if it was your mind or your heart. I can't remember the third one. But mm-hmm. he basically said, like, a lot of people are losing that the technical skills in today's time, like the hand. Of, 
Um, yeah, they're not really f- taught in art, like the premier art schools, that as much as they would have been 100, 150 years ago or whatever. Yeah. It's so conceptual, the focus of most like higher education in art. Totally. Which is important. But <laughs> is art just going to become like the realm of just like smart, clever, uh, like. <laughs> Con- con- conceptual pieces that don't really like are we just going to lose all the like the technical side of painting mm-hmm. which is probably appropriate have you i don't know if you've been following the uh rise of ai generated art just in the last couple months it's exploded no. to where artificial intelligence uh has been able to like render incredibly like beautiful like painterly images yeah. based on any text prompt you feed in and like gives you many options <laughs> yeah and That's with, not a surprise. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it's really not, but um, I listen to some, like, tech podcasts, and, like, this is really, like, unprecedented. Like, just a year ago, this wasn't possible mm-hmm. to have, like, the fidelity. And it's going to transition to video. Like, you'll be able to just render a Hollywood-looking movie with just, like, AI-generated yeah. effects. Yeah. So with that in mind, like, having the ability to render something with paint is such a niche like not super marketable skill like besides it being like a one of a kind artwork and like that that's what will be the value of art and just the fact that it came from like your subconscious and your your yeah. heart and like and not just like a computer but as far as the technique involved like it's going to be more and more irrelevant basically knowing how to paint mm-hmm. um but at the same time, you could also argue there's going to be less and less supply of yeah, maybe <laughs> talented people who can make the painting. So they'll become more and more rare. And whenever things become more and more rare, they become more and more sought after and appreciated. Um, and the yeah. human element like, is so, I feel like it's so important because they made that work because of who they are, because of their life experiences, because how they see the world, because of how they respond to the world and observe things and make thing make that specific artwork. So like just for argument's sake, if we were to take that small painting of yours, which I absolutely love, and put it on the wall and then right next to it you'd take an art artificially AI painting, it was the exact same rendering your piece will have that much more meaning because it came from you, from your life experience, where something else just came from a a computer that can follow a program. There's no soul right. to the piece. Yeah. And I, it can be I replicated agree. over and over and over again too. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think you're right that the human made the human touch will always be, add a, like a special thing that and like we saw the hockney ipad show last mm-hmm. night mm-hmm. uh that's what like these ai generated pieces would look like printed out or projected they're just flat they they don't have dimension and like texture right. but right. even a very f- smooth flat oil painting like there's layers and there's like yeah. pigment and like real stuff like mm-hmm. physical matter used in an extremely complex and like intricate way to make that image but it, it comes down to like what what do people like look to art for? And if you have the ability, you want to see an image of something, and you can just type it in, and like yeah. there it is, a beautifully rendered image of like some, like a dragon killing right. a a <laughs> boar. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. just like <laughs> whatever your flight of fancy wants at that moment, you mm-hmm. can make it. You don't have to like pay an artist to do it for you. Or and then it or ends like, up on your computer screen. Yeah, but you could print it on canvas or something right. and have a one-of-a-kind artwork made by an AI. Yeah. And if, it'll serve the function of, like, art. But um, but if art is, like, supposed to be, like, a celebration of, like, individuals and their unique vision, then it'll it'll always be around. But it's very interesting to see how, like, the role of visual art will change in the next 50 years, like, when this stuff gets even more prevalent. Mm-hmm. 
I've heard the concept artists for like Hollywood studios or video games and stuff, they'll be the first to take a hit because their work is kind of disposable to begin with. Mm. They're doing it to like generate an image for a production to like have as a reference. And right now they get paid a lot to do that because it takes skills and years of training. But if AI can just make an image that's just as good or better for free, <laughs> right. like those artists are out of a job because yeah. they're not being paid for their unique talent they're being paid to like cheaply make an image i think this is going to happen across every sector in every field where artificial intelligence is going to take away jobs mm -hmm. and i mean not to get too into like the social political economic ideas but it it in order for people to survive, there's going to have to be like a, a minimum income that people get because jobs are going to keep disappearing um, in order yeah. for people to survive. Universal so basic income. You know, you're talking about these people in Hollywood who are graphic designers or whatnot. I mean, think about how many people make their living that way. If all those jobs are gone, then, well, where do they go? And, you know, and you see it right now when whenever you're going to like a CVS or something the cashiers are replaced with the automatic checkout or like grocery stores so I actually mm -hmm. never go on those lines I'd rather wait like five or ten minutes to interact with the person because they're so the, these are like the more blue collar type people are affected but what are we yeah. going to do as that like technology moves up the ladder so, like, my wife's a radiologist, you know. What if there's AI that can read imaging? You know, then you start mm -hmm. to see, like, doctors losing their jobs and, you know, um, start replacing people in all sorts of fields. I mean, we're talking about artists. We should probably be the last ones to be replaced by AI. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're but, dealing with the heart and with the emotions, which like AI, AI will never have, like or memories and feelings, like yeah. But anything that a computer can like analyze data or like perform a task with some machinery attached to it, like there'll be no need for for humans to like devote their lives to. to there's so many tasks that like yeah. we rely on people for that will probably no longer be the case in who knows how long. Yeah, but how we get on that subject? You. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk a bit about like <laughs> music, but this conversation is honestly so fascinating about like visual art and yeah. creativity that like I don't really want to stop. But well, it's interesting because you do both music and art, and I don't do music, so you can. But go you have a this. very strong passion for it. I love you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it affects I, the way you make art. I find myself more and more as I get older listening to classical music all the time. I love classical music now and I and I never really liked it growing yeah. up. I thought I, it was so I, boring. <laughs> yeah, I I I think I I would guess like eighty percent of music eighty percent of the time I listen to music I put on classical. It's really wow. cool. Um I find it very calming and uplifting and meditative and um and so I when love you see it uh, live i love going to the symphony or the ballet mm -hmm. um and i find myself putting on records at home that are ballet that are um classical and um it's uh, it's interesting because i was never exposed to music as kids as a kid and I find myself, that's really one of the things that I want to give to my daughters and my son as he gets older, is is that foundation of music, of learning music at a young age. Mm -hmm. None of your siblings, like, played instruments or anything? No, nothing. But your dad no. would love, you said he loved, like... Uh, loved, yeah, but never played R &B anything, and no. stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Do you uh, listen to classical music a lot, too? I've been getting like more and more into it. I, I wouldn't say I like put it on at home much, but yeah. when I teach, I I put on music on a little Bluetooth speaker in the classroom and it's it's usually classical or sometimes jazz, but yeah. mostly instrumental, more to like create a, a vibe. 
And I used to find it so boring, like anything that didn't have lyrics and like drums and electric guitars, I would, I would kind of dismiss. Yeah. But music is, is so abstract, just like abstract painting is. Mm-hmm. And like just notes in sequence and rhythms are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They resonate with you no matter like what the genre is. And like classical music is so full of like rich content. And the history too. Like yeah. you talk about like being a painter. Um, I love that you listen to classical music now. I wouldn't have guessed because you're like the quintessential like 90s rock <laughs> yeah. guy I know. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just because I'm older than you. So you like associate me. And I love but that music I, too. But that was the music I grew up on too. Just because yeah. even though I was like too young to really appreciate it in its prime, when I started paying attention to music, it was still all all that was on the radio like right. rock radio in the late 90s totally. early 2000s they were still playing pearl jam mm-hmm. and nirvana and smashing pumpkins so yeah I, that was the first music i loved so yeah and i i feel mean, like the music as a kid is what kind of sticks with you throughout your life for yeah the most part for sure it's harder to to get into brand new artists and, and music as you get older. It but is. Like classical music is like so rewarding to like dig into. It's, yeah, it's so rewarding. It's be- And there's always like the, the local classical music station on the radio too. So I find myself listening to it when, a lot when I drive, when I'm falling asleep um, in the studio. Um, and like I said, going to the ballet or the symphony. Mm-hmm. It's like really just calming meditative experiences um do you do you ever go to the joffrey here the ballet i've been on a couple like field trips in high school but not not as an adult (laughs) yeah because i'm thinking about going tomorrow night if you wanted to go but tomorrow night i think we're actually having band practice oh you are yeah (laughs) <laughs> you should check it out because you can. A lot of times you can get really reasonable price tickets too to go there. Yeah. Um, I found myself doing this a lot when I was in San Francisco. I would go to the symphony or the ballet by myself, and wow, there's some. There, it's a different experience when you go to a music event or like it's like going to a movie by yourself. You know, it just feels a little different. Yeah, you know, than when you go on a date or with a friend or friends or something. Do you ever get like restless sitting in a like a two hour classical concert or ballet? Like, because I no. used to do get that all the time. No, it had the opposite effect. Wow, cool. And sometimes you 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 start daydreaming, you know, in that sort of way. But it it has a way of bringing you into the present moment too. Yeah, um, but you can work through a lot of things in your head in that that lucid thinking kind of you know i'm gonna have to try that because i was like scarred by like my my parents taking me to like a classical music concert growing up and like i would get so bored i'd be like this is going on and on that's why i asked you about the joffrey because ballet is so beautiful because you have the music and then you can but you're visually and they're you know performing in, in sync with the music as well so it's like one plus one equals three i find mm-hmm. um cool. and yeah it's just and ballet is fascinating to me too because it's it's an art form but it's also it's also a athletic too you know like the physical physicality of it is so intense what they can do with their bodies yeah um but they do everything artistically and like then you think back like well that's kind of what sports are it's like art with your body you know it's just we don't we don't see it that way because of how all the other cultural um constructs that have been built around it yeah and the competitive aspect like yeah. kind of takes precedence. You yeah. Know, but if you can something. remove that. Like I remember I had a coach in high school who was a wrestling coach and he um he was a dedicated um Buddhist and he would go to the ashram and meditate and talk about 
um, being completely unaware of what the score was or the outcome of the, the match or the results and being completely lost in the moment and the act of the move that you were doing at the time. And that's Talking what, about wrestling? Yeah, wrestling. And that's what, like, ballet is, too. Yeah. You know, there's no scoreboard. There's no, like, quote-unquote result. Just, like, completely focus on, like, the, the choreography and, and the, move, the, mo- the movement in the moment. And um, so it's, like, this, it's an art, but it's, it's so physical. How can it not be a, a sport, too, <laughs> you know? Um, mm-hmm. so I feel like the ballet, that with, with the classical music on top of it, it's, it's really empowering to watch. I don't know anything about it. My wife did ballet growing up, so she knows a lot more of the technical, but even me as like a lay person who knows nothing about classical music, nothing about ballet, I still find myself really intrigued by it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that sounds beautiful. Does it even matter what the particular ballet is? Because they, they have like stories. They're like specific narratives. Yeah, I find for me the, I mean, to each their own, but for me, I like more of like the minimalist, less story, hmm. less narrative where I can, I don't have to necessarily follow the, the story behind it, but just be like focused on the movements. I find that, like I'd rather have, Two dan two or three see watching two or three dancers on stage and like fifteen, okay, but that's just my own personal kind of. Is that a common thing in like contemporary ballet to have like very minimal arrangement, just a couple dancers? That sounds more like modern dance or something. Um, I've seen everything. I guess I don't. I don't yeah. know, but. The one thing I saw at Joffrey was like the Nutcracker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There was like a huge production, costumes, and like 30 dancers on the stage. They just redid it, I think, a year or two ago, where they have a completely different um, costumes and, and set designs, and it looked amazing. The at Joffrey. the Joffrey? Yeah, at the Joffrey. Is Joffrey like a well respected ballet company and like nationwide? Yeah, it was ori- well. It was originally in New York, and it moved to Chicago. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. When did it move? <laughs> don't know exactly when. I want to say like fifteen years ago, but I don't know. Um. Oh, that recent? I could have, have sworn it's been check. here because when back when I was in grade school, I had a classmate who was like a ballet prodigy, basically, and she went to my, she was in my class, but she like danced at the Joffrey, mm. I think. So as maybe like it was one longer. A child yeah. dancer. Yeah, that would have been like late 90s. You have to look that up. I don't know. What is the biggest ballet company in uh, New York called? Is there a there's, famous um, one? A couple famous ones, I'm sure. What is it? Um, like, I don't know off the top of my head. American Ballet Theater. I that's what I was going to say. Something think? American Ballet something. Yeah. Is yeah. Juilliard a ballet school or is it just a music conservatory? I think it's both. But it's definitely dance. Yeah, it's definitely dance. Uh, okay, I didn't realize. Yeah, I know it's like those classical music and stuff. And modern dance, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you're going to get your kids into playing music? Is that what you like? Get them an instrument in their hand? They or are. Uh, yeah. Really? What are, what are they yeah. learning? I started them off when they were they were probably four and they started taking a class that they had like ukulele and piano and violin, you know, just as a four year old, you know, just kind of yeah. learning how to hold instruments and whatnot. And then last year I they were in this class called Kids Rock where <laughs> <laughs> nice. there were drums, electric guitar and keyboard and there was another kid in the, it was my twins and then there was another kid in the class who loved the drums um now they're taking a piano class so i just kind of want to expose them to things you know they do ballet and music and eventually they'll play like soccer or whatnot but art you know just i feel like as a parent i want to expose them to different things and see what they naturally gravitate towards Mm -hmm. and then encourage them but not 
not force them into a certain path. Right. Because that might not be the path that's for them. But if at this age, you know, they're almost six, you just present to them like a buffet of different things and see what they like. And the reason I signed them up for about, for um, uh, piano classes because I would ask them, what's your favorite instrument in this little class you're playing? You like the drums? Do you like violin? Ukulele? And they, they both said piano, piano. And I would ask them, you know, many times. And they would always say piano, piano. So that's, I said, all right, we'll, we'll do a piano class. Yeah. You would know more about this, obviously, than I would, but um, their teacher told me that piano is a really great instrument to learn first because visually all of the keys are laid out. And yeah. if you can learn piano, then you can incorporate the same skills into other instruments. But if you were to learn like guitar first, it would be different because it's not as visual. Mm-hmm. That's that's a really good way of putting it. I I don't know if you know this, but I I like my parents gave got me in piano lessons when I was like from six to like eleven or twelve. I, I took know. like weekly piano lessons with a a Lithuanian pianist that my dad knew through his the college he taught at. He taught in the music department there. Oh, that's amazing! And uh, I'm so grateful to them now that they they started me on that when they did. Cause, yeah, like I I think it really it made me understand music when I like today, even though, uh, be prepared for this with your daughters. Yeah. Like they might hate it. Totally. <laughs> they might get, feel like it's such a drag to have to like practice piano, like classical pieces, which, cause I did like, I, I liked it. And I liked like doing our little recitals. They were like a bit of excitement in my, uh, grade school life where I got to feel like I was like making music and, Playing it for people totally like, really super stressed me out too. But yeah, um, I'm grateful for that too. But the the weekly lessons and practice, like, uh, like I, I resented it at the time, but of I'm course. really grateful now that yeah. they, I stuck with it for as long as I did. Which I stopped playing piano at like 12 and switched to guitar, and, and never really like studied piano that seriously after that. And totally, but it set the foundation. Yeah. yeah. And like that that um that idea of like instilling discipline and a practice in a kid mm -hmm. that carries throughout your whole life, you know? Yeah. It's like part of being a parent, I feel like, is um trying to do what's best for your kid, but also balancing that with just their their happiness. So, like, if you go, you know, if you just let your kid do whatever the hell they want, whenever they want, that's not ultimately going to be good for them. But then if you force them to, like, you know, do lessons every day, they're going to be miserable. So I, I was thinking yeah. of, like, the Buddhists, like, the middle road, the middle path, you know, of guiding them. Which is so, like, unsatisfying in the moment, <laughs> like, the middle path, but <laughs> it's the right answer. You don't get the like satisfaction of like saying like, screw this, I'm not touching it again. And you, <laughs> you don't get the like crazy, like discipline of like really going full force yeah. into something, but like a little moderation, like is sustainable and it ultimately is good for you. So totally. Like I was talking to their, their music teacher, um, I don't know, six months ago. And I was like, so how much, like, we don't have a piano at home. We're going to get one probably for their birthday in December. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, when I do get a piano, like how much should the girls play? And he was like, they'll let you know. <laughs> so if you try to force them every day, you're going to play a half hour, that will backfire. He's like, so you'll naturally see if, if five minutes is good for them, then that's how long they should play five minutes. If 15 yeah. minutes. And so he said, they'll like you, you provide them with these things, but then you also listen and, and watch, not not like parenting or teaching with a heavy hand. Yeah, that's this piano teacher sounds really wise, <laughs> or he's probably dealt with this a lot with parents and. He's and students. great. Yeah, he has a whole kind of school. He has a whole school, and he has kids, and mm -hmm. he's been through it both as a teacher and as a parent. So I think he's and he's been doing it for, I think, thirty five years or something. So he has a lot of experience, but. 
Yeah. Piano is like a great thing to learn uh, at that age because it's not so abrasive as like... <laughs> Violin is a beautiful instrument, but beginner violin is one of the most like mm. excruciating sounds on yeah. the planet. <laughs> yeah. And if a student can like s- get super into it and develop like in a few years and sound like decent, right? <laughs> then it's okay. But <laughs> yeah, it's such a hard instrument to learn because there's no frets. You have to like right. really have a like very developed ear to play in tune, and like the physical, it's very physically demanding. Uh, Guitar is a little bit the same way, but much easier from a like tuning perspective because of the frets. But yeah, the frets. It's pretty hard on the fingers, and there's a phys- there's physical limitations of totally. like, the size of an ins- a guitar. Yeah, a six year old can play. It's like a ukulele is nice. Ukulele is nice. Kid. I've never really gone too deep into the ukulele world, um, or but it's probably a great like, you yeah, <laughs> like great gateway into maybe guitar or bass or something. But piano, like, yeah, it will really teach them how how music works and, like, the, at least the 12 notes of the yeah. Western music scale, which yeah. is not universal, by the way. Music, piano is a little bit of a, a compromise of, like, what sounds good to our Western classical music ear. Like, it's not a, not a universal thing that, like those 12 notes, the black and white keys are like the only notes in music. Oh, really? It's, yeah. <laughs> this is a bit going down a rabbit hole, but like piano uses something called even temperament tuning where it's exactly the space between the octave. It's like equal. A, a low A and a high A. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're the same note, but you divide up that octave 12 into... I hope I'm saying the right number. It's 12 steps, but there's like 13 plus the high octave. They're divided equally, so you can play it on a piano with, it plays in every key equally well, Mm. but it's a bit of a compromise (laughs) because the the (laughs) intervals that are most important to like harmony and like music are like a major third, which sounds very happy and Mm. harmonious. Uh, and a minor third sounds very sad. They're they're different on a piano than they would be on like a violin or something with no frets, where you just put your finger exactly that sweet spot uh, where it's, the note sounds perfect. A piano can't actually do that. A piano is a little bit sharp of a major third, and it might be a little flat of a minor third, but I could be wrong about that. But they're a little. The, it's a compromise to so it can play every key that you'd want to play in equally well. Um, but so do you think that you learning piano first enabled you to, to really appreciate or notice those differences between like piano to guitar or violin or... Do you want some of this? Yeah. <laughs> I, took, I took the only liquor we have in the house and brought it over here. I know. <laughs> No, thank you for tidying up the home before you left. It was kind of a train wreck when I left, and I was like, oh, man, Roger's going to think we're slobs. Are you kidding me? Like, all over the couch. <laughs> and I was like, is the living room straightened up? And he's like, it's fine. It's and right. And was like, this is what you call fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it looks great to me. I wanted to say that it's interesting that it seems like you are such a compliment or, or of both your mom and your dad because your mom was an artist, a visual artist, and you said your dad got you on piano lessons and he taught in a music department. No, no. Uh, he knew a guy in his p- music department. Oh, but um, he wasn't in he the wasn't, music department. He, actually, he played a little like acoustic guitar and piano, but he wasn't a music teacher or anything. He was our history teacher. Okay. Um, so how, um, so does your musicality come from just learning, having lessons as a little kid? Probably. Cause neither of my parents are like super musically, uh, inclined yeah. beyond just being appreciators of it. But like, so during your formative like your years, you were kind of doing both though. Yes. I think they, just like you are there, they were trying to be the best possible parents and like saw the value of like musical education as part of a well-rounded yeah. like 
life. So totally. they, they got both me and my sister into it. And to appreci- at the very least to like appreciate the arts. Yeah. You know? And music is like sort of the, the most pure one to appreciate. It just affects you on such an emotional level. Totally. And visual art can do it too, but music like speaks directly to your soul. <laughs> Music's more accessible, I feel like, too. Yeah. Because it's, it's everywhere. It like is. In visual art, you really have to make an effort to go and see it and learn, a bra- learn about it. Learn about it, yes and no, but you have to go to the museum or the galleries or, like, no artists or take an art history class music. It's like you just turn on a knob and on your radio, there's music. It's a very, I mean, I agree. It really hits you emotionally, especially live music, Mm -hmm. but it's also a very like in this day and age, a very uh, passive experience too. Like music's in the elevator or in like CVS or, in a car when you're talking with your friend it's just it's kind of everywhere that it it becomes like nowhere like when you yeah. go look at art in a museum if you're really experiencing it you're like standing in front of painting it's just you and the painting and you're you're it's a one to one kind of direct experience but music a lot of times it's like in the background or it's uh it's not re- you're not like fully invested like think about the amount of times that a person will put a record on and just sit there with nothing else going on in the room and and listen intently to the music you're I, saying that's rare i think it's very rare yeah i mean maybe you as a musician does that more often no i actually don't but like or <laughs> or like the experience of going to a museum and looking at a work Intently, it's kind of like going to a concert and really focusing on the music, you know. So yeah, but music, uh, visual art happens at your the viewer's own pace. Like you can spend five seconds with a painting, mm-hmm. or you can spend half an hour with a painting. Like totally, uh, I <laughs> in our more like uh, hyperactive, like attention deficit age, like visual art is kind of a more. Um, accessible medium and the it, it you don't have to commit to like even listening to a whole four minute song you just look at the painting and get what you need from it and you can move on yeah which is nice you can see a whole museum in an hour and you'll be rushing but yeah like, you don't have to commit <laughs> three hours of your evening to going to a concert and waiting in line and and all that stuff totally i don't go to live music very often because it just it's so hard to stand for so long and <laughs> standing room only pits and and just like the waiting the between scene. sets yeah. and it's it's stressful and <laughs> and yet it sounds so much better right like live music the it the energy is yeah like amazing and to see a band like making the music in front of you is great but so many i've been let down by a lot of recent shows i've been to like bands that i felt were like real live rock bands because they're playing to tracks they have live bands but they they have extra stuff like Mm. maybe a little synth part in the background or some backing vocals that they'll they'll play back which is fine on its own like it makes the band sound more full and more like the record but what it means is that everyone is playing to like a preset click track oh wow (laughs) that means they can line up with that backing vocal or backing track at all. So there, it removes like that spontaneity and that like looseness that I used to like love live music for. Of course. Um, like the bands that we both like, like they don't do that, but a lot of like modern, like young oh, up and coming wow. rock indie That's bands, they, they all do that cause it's the norm. Oh wow. It lets you sound like way more professional with less equipment and less people on stage. So keep more money for the band. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. 
you can tell when it's happening because you'll just hear sounds that <laughs> there's no one making <laughs> right. on stage or like extra vocals when no one's singing. Yeah. Uh, but it kind of makes me like feel like it's not worth the, the, the effort to go see bands and mm. if they're, if that's just the norm and maybe Do you them... still keep up on like who the new bands are because a little bit, but... I feel like I haven't discovered other than Ila Bamba, who I absolutely love in the last like 15 years i i really <laughs> yeah there's not a lot i don't out know there. what the new music is it's just a total hodgepodge of everything that came before and that's the way music always has been but the internet has like accelerated it to such a crazy degree mm. that yeah. it's just like it's very hard to keep up with and i think music is very like disposable and has a short lifespan now yeah yeah especially if you're young and in the part of your life where you're just devouring new music you probably jump from artist to artist like pretty quickly totally until you find one or two that really speak to you and you become a fan for his for the rest of your life or however long you uh that artist is still making music yeah but yeah it's such a different like world than when like we both started like listening to music and like where you had to go buy a cd <laughs> Or and like li- heard stuff on the radio that you liked, and you're like, "What is that?" And mm-hmm. then you like looked it up and or found out, and it was it was hard to find out sometimes. <laughs> yeah, or or this idea too that music was a like a record, like something you would listen straight through, and like the mm-hmm. previous song would influence the next song, and the flow of the the side or the album had an impact. Like the sum of the the parts were greater, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that's lost too. Um, like I have a, you know, a record player at home with a lot of records and I play that. I really like the fact that I don't play digital music for my, my daughters. They know like music is on a record or, or they go to their music class and they make music. But this idea that there's a physicality, like there's a physical, um, object that creates the music and we listen, and you can watch it spinning, and hear it as a whole album. And it's not, at least the music that I get, it's not like digitized. You know, it's not like what you're describing. Yeah, it's not perfect. Like albums weren't made that way. You know, back in the day. Um, do me a favor and aim that mic a little more towards your mouth. You can stay where you were, but just make sure it's yeah. like facing you. It has a small pickup area. So I think that uh, with everything that, that's gained, something is lost, too. Like Music is so much more accessible now or democratized. Mm-hmm. democratized. But it's not... It's, not um, it's so quickly to move on. Or to not be invested in it. It's like, oh, I don't like this song. I'll skip to, I'll skip. You know, they're not. The concept of an album is being lost in a lot of ways too. Yeah, for sure. And the like, the gatekeepers that would like <laughs> determine what how music reaches an audience have changed so much that it's and it's so like confusing to know like yeah. where where are people discovering music now? i don't even know where to start i don't know where you find new music um uh, do you have spotify do you use it or do you just like only listen to records and and vinyl and uh, i listen to it if i'm like traveling or things like that but when i'm at home then yeah i listen to records uh, but even on Spotify, I just look at listen to my library. Yeah, you look up things, but there's apparently like a lot of artists get big from being on like curated Spotify playlists. Like there's yeah. just like person, they're not even artists themselves, but they like have are recognized for the curating mm. playlists that people like. So there are people who follow these playlist <laughs> makers, and That's to get your m- music onto one of those oh, wow. is a is a gateway to to wow. like reaching a wider audience. Yeah. That's how crazy it is. And then there's like social media, like TikTok has broken so many con- modern like pop stars and stuff. Oh, I but didn't know that. I don't really understand how <laughs> how that w- starts cuz uh a song will get really huge and like go viral. Everyone in the 
who's on TikTok under the age of 21 will know this song, but only, and because of that, it gets more popular and people right. use it as the background in their videos and it reaches more people. But yeah. I don't know how the original song got, pop- got, got popular in the first <laughs> place. Like, yeah. it's, I guess there's just like, people are searching for that viral sound that like you hear five seconds of and you're like, oh, like, let me use yeah. that. Let me reshare it. Like, but that's, it means like the, the window you need to grab an audience is is getting smaller and smaller. It's probably the same for visual art that you're trying to like get people's attention on Instagram or something with a painting. Like it has to like, it has to connect with people like that. Yeah. Uh, otherwise yeah. they just keep scrolling. It has to be like visually stimulating Im- immediately. Like how a pop song, like I think about music, you know, a uh, pop song is is catchy and it's good, mm-hmm. and then after you listen to hear it ten or twenty times or fifty times, whatever the number is, then it you don't want to hear it ever again. <laughs> but like you think about the great albums or the great songs, you can listen to them for your life. You know they still impact you. Like Joshua Tree is still a fucking amazing album, um, but it might not grab you right away or like. I was talking to you earlier about No Code. Like, that album is so good. I still listen to it 30 years later, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and with visual art, it's like, it's the same thing. Like, on Instagram or something, oh, something might catch your eye right away because it's really vibrant or colorful. It looks cool, you know? And the artist can keep making them over and over again. And you can recognize it as, oh, that artist does this thing. And they're really quote cool they look good but but like what's going to have longevity is it like the pop song art or is it the art that maybe doesn't look so great on your phone but when you experience it in person you know over and over again you can you keep coming back to it try to figure out what's going on there like what is this this person has something to say that's like i can't quite grasp it yet you know that's why um, I think social media and Instagram are, it's a double-edged sword because people want to get their art out there and show other people what they're doing. But like, it's really not a good medium to put out visual art. You, you lose scale, uh, for a painter at least, like scale and texture mm-hmm. and, and pasto and brushstroke and physicality, like so much is lost. But you feel, but yet, so many artists feel forced into this. It's like insufficient medium to put their work out there, just just to share. Because artists, I think, naturally want to share what they're doing, um, and that's a problem. Yeah. I think that's a that's a that's a dilemma that artists have to struggle with and kind of talk about and figure out. Like, are are people artists or appreciators of art experiencing art in person at greater numbers or lesser numbers because of social Instagram or social media, you know, is it encouraging people to go to the galleries or the museums to see the work or is it discouraging them by, by saying, well, I saw it. I saw the work on the installations on, on Instagram or on the website, even for that matter. Um, because it's it's like listening to digital music versus going to the concert. You know? Yeah. There's a lot that's lost. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sure it encourages some people to get out there. They see something they like on on social media, and then they go, and maybe they're going so they can get their own photo op. With yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take a selfie in front of uh, something they saw on social media. And totally. So it, it probably promotes or like helps as much as it hurts and like means that some people are like, I don't need to see it. I already saw it. Yeah. Or like you see something, oh, that wasn't any good. I saw it on Instagram. Maybe it's a really different experience in person though. The sun's coming into your eyes now. Yeah. Your eyes do look a little green or blue. They get they get kind of green sometimes. But you, when you're looking at that, 
Sophie Calais poster <laughs> about the blue eyes, blonde hair. You said my eyes aren't blue, but they're not brown. <laughs> what do you call, what What do you call your eye color? I don't know because uh, they're either brown or hazel or green. I don't know. Okay, and it it can change. The rarest eye color. And what's the rare? I think like green is supposed to be pretty rare. Yeah. My mom used to have brown eyes. She was, and now she has one blue eye and one green eye. Oh. Yeah. And my eyes used to be brown, brown. And now they're like kind of more hazelish. Is that a thing? Like, I guess eyes so. Lightening? My eyes have definitely changed color. And my mom's have too. Wow. So I don't know if it's a genetic thing or what, but like David Bowie, didn't he have two different colored eyes? Oh, did he? Uh, I don't know what colors they were, but I know he was known for that. Hmm. Are you getting cold? I'm a no. little cold. You cold? <laughs> but you have a nice blazer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like looking around, like, is there a shirt are you around here I can put on? Um, but I won't. Chain wreck the continuity of the episode by changing outfits. You can change. I like your Radiohead T-shirt. Are they done? Are they still? Are they? I, I've read some like clickbaity news articles that say like Radiohead is finished. Yeah. Tom York and Johnny Greenwood are doing the Smile now. Yeah. Yeah. And the last Radiohead album was like probably their last. Yeah. I could see that being true. Uh, Ed O'Brien did a solo album That's too. Right. That's right. Do you have you heard any of Johnny Greenwood's classical music? Well, I've s- I've watched There Will Be those? Blood, and that has. Some. Hang on a second. I'm just gonna throw in a show. Okay. I should probably go in like twenty minutes or something. Too. Yeah, that sounds. That's probably good. We're talking about Johnny Greenwood. Yeah, his he does a lot of those soundtracks for Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah, they're amazing. His classical music is unbelievable. He's just uber talented. Yeah, um, it? it's very like ape, like dissonant and unsettling, right? At yeah. least the one in there. There will be blood. Was. There will be blood. Has he done others for Paul Thomas Anderson? Yes. He did, uh, what was it, Phantom Thread and The Master. Okay. Uh, he did that recent movie about Princess Diana. Oh, uh, really? The um, That's not Paul Thomas Anderson, though, is it? I think he did the soundtrack to that, too. I, th- I don't know who did the film. I haven't seen it. Did he do Licorice Pizza? I haven't seen don't the movie, know. but I know Paul Thomas Anderson has a new movie about, like, 70s L.A. Uh, I don't know if Johnny Greenwood did that or not. It doesn't seem like a movie he would be involved in. Yeah, I don't think so. Seems more lighthearted. Yeah, I think he's an incredible musician. I think Tom York is like an incredible songwriter too. Yeah. But bands kind of run their course. Like maybe the other members, they're not seeing eye to eye anymore. And I think it's really, really difficult for a band to be amazing for more than a decade. Yeah, I would agree. 10, 15 years. I think Radiohead between like 90, like a, between OK Computer, kind of the bands. Yeah, even Pablo 95. Honey, I think, is a great album. Yeah, they had like 15 years, I think. It's a long run. Yeah. I mean, like the Beatles were around for nine years. I know. know. So short. Years, so short. Uh, Pearl Jam's getting up there. It's crazy. <laughs> like they're, I mean, a lot of these bands start at the same time, and you can look at like the landscape of like. <laughs> it sounds demeaning, but I would call them classic rock bands yeah. now. Pearl yeah. Jam, Foo totally. Fighters. Um, <laughs> Part of me wishes like they stopped making music years ago. Yeah, you know, like the Foo Fighter, like Foo Fighters. I look at like the first ten years of Pearl Jam was really, really, really great. No like, code had to be near the end of that, right? No code came out in ninety six. What? Yeah. It's that early? Yeah. I thought it was like late nineties or even early two thousands or something. You so it was their fifth, third, fourth album. It fifth came album? out after Vitology. It's their fourth album. 
You should just listen to the first side of No Code. Like the first side A is, it's just amazing. Like that I've album. Listen to it. Uh, my dad like collect like had Radiohead on CD, uh, Pearl Jam on CD. So I had that CD growing up, and I like tried to listen to it multiple times, and yeah. I would. It like never grabbed me like ten did. Uh, so I like kind of like I loved Pearl Jam. I loved Ten so much. I listened to that over and over, but I never really like no code was too weird and like artsy for me. That's at why the I time. love it. Yeah, I love it. It's um yeah, it's definitely it's I would say it's their most eclectic album and it's it's um it was they did no promotion for it, so they really wanted to lose fans, which was kind of like so punk in a they way. They were fighting you know, with Ticketmaster like, too. Yeah. Like I was looking at the track list for No Code, like on the train just now, and yeah. like I recognized the to- song titles. Hail Hail is like a great like punky song. Yeah. Uh, but like I couldn't remember how most of the others. Sounded. I think it's their most introspective album of any album. Okay. And the opening track sometimes is really quiet and subdued, and it kind of sets the tone for the whole album. And every other album they've had, they've never started off with like a really quiet song. And so mm-hmm. I think just like right off the bat, you notice there's something different to it. Um, I remember the album art being really cool. The album art is great. The album art was based on the Talking Heads album. Um Hmm. I forget the Talking Heads album, but um, of all the Polaroids making up the four members of the Talking Heads, you can look up what it is. Um, I'll I'll put a a picture right here. Yeah. (laughs) And the No Code one. So, yeah, I remember having that album, I think, was based on Hockney. Hockney's photographs. Uh, multiple, Multiple Polaroids consisting of one image. Mm hmm. So it's it's like two steps removed, but um, it was Yield the next album after No yeah. Code? Okay, and that seemed like to go back in a slightly more like commercial direction. Yeah, Yield and then Binaural, and then after Binaural, I think. <laughs> I mean, I still follow them, but not. It was. Yeah, I think the first ten years, which goes back to my theory about him, like a man. It's very true, or even like artists too. I think it's really hard. I look at someone like even someone like the greats, like you know Matisse or Picasso. Like the early stuff is like, usually the best. Uh, like <laughs> Matisse from nineteen oh five six to like nineteen twenty. Pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. And then he had the cutouts at the very end of his life, which were unbelievable. Picasso, the same thing, like the blue period, the rose period, cubism, like it's class classical work. Yeah. Same kind of time period. But then there's like oh, there's a lot of filler in there after that. <laughs> like that's kind of how it is with like the stones or Pearl Jam. You know, you get glimpses here and there of greatness, but I I wonder if that's just the fate of all creative people. Like you, you get your best work out at some point. You have a peak, and it takes a while to get there. You're developing totally. your whole life to like figure out how to make that thing. But then once you hit it, like you can either repeat it, <laughs> yeah, which no one wants to do, or you experiment and branch out. And but it's never really going to reach the same yeah. heights. You're just kind of yeah. like keeping it going. That's why pavement's so amazing, or like Zeppelin, say, or like Nine, or the Beatles. There's no filler, like just you know. It's stopped. just like bang, boom, boom, nine out, like eight out, eight, yeah. and it's all it's all great, you know. And like sometimes tragedy inv- is involved, like Kurt dying yeah. in '94. Like Nirvana's discography is like, yeah, three super incredible albums and then nothing else totally and so much uh either way you... you're screwed because then people want more <laughs> or <laughs> people say like they should have stopped making music you know you're yeah. damned if you do and oh, you're damned man. if you don't totally and if you survive being a rock star for 10 plus years you want to 
keep doing the thing. Totally. Like these guys are probably like still having a great time. They're probably healthier and happier than ever. Yeah. But that doesn't really make for good music. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or yeah. art. Totally. Well, there's something really intense about like your 20s, I feel like. Yeah. Like things feel really like relationships are really intense at that age and mm-hmm. your passion and your beliefs and what you stand for. And then I feel like as you get a little older, you get more comfortable in your own skin and what you believe in and you're not you're not so rattled by other people um Mm. and that's great for your personal life but i don't know how great it is for like making a great great song (laughs) there are there are exceptions i will say bob dylan has had like yeah masterpieces of albums totally like there's a lot of filler in his discography but Mm -hmm. He has like great albums in his twenties, great albums in his thirties, like like a couple of them, and even into his forties, fifties, totally. sixties, he'll, yeah. he'll at least put out like, like one his or music two in the great 70s albums. And yeah, some yeah, yeah. People say stuff that he made when he was like thirty five, going through a divorce, like Blood on the Tracks, Blood like on his, the tracks his greatest unbelievable. album, Blonde on Blonde. Yeah, Bruce Springsteen too has longevity. Like totally. he's made some incredible albums, like recently. Yeah, I love Bruce. I, I didn't discover him until like. In my 30s. Like, I mean, I knew about, obviously, like, Born in the USA and all that. And liked him as a kid, but I wasn't like, this guy's total badass. Yeah. And as I get older, I was like, wow, he is really, <laughs> he is something, that guy. And he's, st- like, look at him now. He's still at it. Yeah. Like, he's got to be in his 70s. 70? I don't know how old he is, but that probably. I mean, his first album came out in 73. That's almost 50 years ago. Yeah, he still seems very, like, vital. Seems totally. like a guy who works out and, like, yeah. takes good care of himself so he can keep, like, kicking ass on yeah. stage. I actually got really into his uh, album that was sort of in, res- in response to 9-11, The Rising. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I wasn't expecting to. I think, like, either my mom or my dad bought that CD, and I ended up, like, listening to it over and over because it... Not because I like thought the topic of nine eleven was like su- super compelling at at that age, like, oh, but yeah, there were really kid. catchy songs. Weirdly enough, about that topic, like, I, it made me realize what a great songwriter he is. That he can turn something such a tragedy into like great like rock music with like some an emotional core to it. I See, think that's where one. it's interesting when you just talked about nine eleven because I'm twelve years older than you. So when that happened, I was... You were like 20 or what? I was... Uh, I was 24. 24. So uh, in in the town I grew up in, in Long Island, there was a lot of commute, commuters to fi- to uh, downtown, like finance. I think there was like about 40... I think there was over 40 people from my town who died in it. My best friend's dad died in 9-11. You know, mm-hmm. and I used to live right down there when I lived in New York City. So I used to go down there a lot with my daughters and stroll them around in the the water pools. Have you been there to like the, the yeah I have. Um, it's it's really well done and beautiful and intense and quiet. I used mm-hmm. to go down there at nighttime a lot and like watch just the water falling. Um, there's a painting I have in the show tonight that's based on that whole scene there. Mm-hmm. Um. But his album, I think it came out, he wrote some of those songs like really immediately after the aftermath of it all. Yeah. And I think he captured something pretty intense in those, the songs. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know what year that was. The, the Rising. The, the Rising. Do you know what year the album came out? Because like... I would guess 2002, but I don't know. In my mind, I was still like... In my memory, I, I at least I was I was like at least like thirteen or fourteen when I heard it, but uh, which I guess that checks out. I was like twelve yeah. when nine eleven happened. Yeah. So, yeah, two thousand two, two thousand three sounds right. I've I've gone back since because my parents were not huge Springsteen fans, but they had like Born in the USA on vinyl. I think that was the only one I remember, like, totally. scrounging from their record collection. Yeah. But I listened to that a bunch. And uh, 
what's the one with Thunder Road on it? Born to Run. Born to Run. You should listen to the album before Born to Run. Darkness it's, on the Edge of Town? Or? No, it's uh, it's the Wild, the Innocent, and the E Street Shuffle. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have heard that. I don't remember it super it's, well. I think it's seven or eight songs. It's really a great album. It didn't have like huge commercial success or anything like that, but that was right before Born to Run. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I used to know his discography better. Like I went through a phase. It was like around grad school, actually. Like when I started listening to all those albums a lot. Uh, but That's it's been I haven't in a while. You can never go wrong with the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Although apparently he hates that nickname. Really? Yeah, because he <laughs> it's like it was like a joke that he's the boss of every of all the other musicians and he was, Oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's um, like such a like working class hero yeah, kind of yeah. guy in his songwriting. Do Nebraska, you know that song Working album. Class Hero by John, John Lennon? Lennon? It's yes. A great song. Uh I actually forget how it goes, I but I know that it's a John song. Lennon song. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, I know I've heard it. You can you can edit it into the podcast. Working class hero. I've actually I haven't put any like actual music that we've discussed on a podcast into the podcast because I'm like I know YouTube is weird about like removing videos that have copyrighted material yeah. and they have like automatic censors that find music. Oh really? <laughs> but I think nowadays they just like monetize it and give the record label money when you when people watch the video yeah. so i don't really care about that i doubt they would find it on your art they, they have like algorithms that mm. just like go through every video and like find they're trained to find copyrighted like waveforms they can just mm. see it with code it's pretty crazy but i'm not doing this to make money no code <laughs> no code Fuck the code. <laughs> it's like a Matrix. <laughs> Pearl Jam should have been the soundtrack of the Matrix. <laughs> that would have been a very different movie. Instead, they got Rage Against the Machine <laughs> yeah. for that first movie. So um, have you seen any good art that you're into lately? Art that I'm See, into? Yeah. What? Like in real life or uh, like yeah, in real on life. Instagram? Whatever. <laughs> Um, let's see. What's been inspiring me lately? Does it have to be contemporary art? No, hell no. <laughs> okay. Like, did you, do you ever see the, did you see the Jacob Bassano? Uh, do no. you know his work? J Jacob o Bassano? No. Who's that? Hey, oh, wait. Jacopo? Hey, Jac Jacopo? Like the yeah. Italian name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a little older than Al Greco. Okay. And there's a piece in the Art Institute that I was checking out yesterday that's gorgeous. And I know he was an influence on Al Greco, who you know my, is my favorite painter. Yeah. Um, I kept trying to... What is the painting you saw? I, if you describe I, it, I, I'll probably I recognize it. I took a it. picture of it. I'll do a bunch... It would be much better if you just look at it than me describing it. Um, let's see... I mean, I have to scroll past all these pictures we sent to a bell. <laughs> Where is it? Did I not take a picture? I don't think I took a picture of it. Is that? It's in one of the halls leading up to the Grecos. You were really into that one? I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll look it up and put I a picture of it. I find myself being more and more into older art. Yeah. And less and less into contemporary art. <laughs> Same. I've I've been on that train for a while. Yeah. Like I went to before the pandemic, we went to Madrid and we went to Toledo and the Prado and we saw the El Grecos in Toledo. He did paintings of Toledo. Did he live yeah. there or something? That's where he lived for like thirty years. That's in Spain? Yeah. It's like a, it's like forty minutes from Madrid. Oh. But like You've never been to Europe, have you? No. Okay. I need to go. So uh, you need badly. to go. <laughs> I need to. I just want to go to go to museums. Yeah. I don't really care about really any other tourist attraction. I just want to go to go to a bunch of museums. <sighs> the museum, the museums, is just the best. 
I have to live in Europe at some time just for this exact reason, mm -hmm. just like the museums and the art and the history of the art. And yeah, it's just like you, we were talking about this earlier, like, going to a contemporary museum is great and it's fun and you see what's happening now and what's going on and in our everyday culture and society what's speaking to people but like going to those museums that are based on art that's like 500 years old or 400 years old or whatnot they've they've stood the test of time you know so like work you're seeing at the prado like it's still hanging on the walls 400 years later and they're spectacular. And then you go to like a contemporary museum today and you think what art here, or like you go to MoMA, like what art here is going to be hanging on these walls in 400 years. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it plays tricks with your mind in a way. But the reason um, El Greco in Toledo is so fantastic is because you see a lot of these works in situ you know, where they're just, they were painted for a specific church, for a specific place, and they're still there mm. 400 years later. Wow. And they're not, it's not like going to see the Mona Lisa where there's 400 other people looking at it behind a bulletproof glass do they charge admission to get into like a church to see it the It depends which one you go to, but like it's minimal, you know. But like the burial of a Count Orgaz, like the El Greco piece, like I looked at that, it's a total masterpiece. And there was like six other people looking at it with me. And it was in the small little church in Toledo. And mm -hmm. um, it's a different experience, you know. Like, have you been to the Barnes Foundation? in uh philadelphia yeah you, you recommended that we go on our road trip but we we skipped philadelphia we just went straight from like delaware to new york yeah it's a similar that's like thing more impressionist because, right uh, well he has a, uh, there's more saisons in that collection than all of paris combined Whoa. um so he has a lot of saisons a lot of renoir um picasso matisse um i'm trying to think what else yeah like just he has some El Greco's, um, but they limit the amount of tickets that you can that mm. are sold each day, so and everything's a... hung salon style. So you go into a room like it's like the size of this room, and there'll be like seven Picassos and fourteen <laughs> saisons. It's like crazy, <laughs> but you're alone in this room. A and it's a style? totally different experience. Will there be stuff like hung right way high up on the wall? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I always think they need to have like a step ladder to uh to get to work that's hung high up in salon style because I need to I need to look at a painting like two <laughs> well, centimeters away. <laughs> that's my preferred way to look at yeah. art in a museum. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. How did they do that? But like you think about like going to to MoMA or the Whitney or something and there are people all over and people are using their phones to take pictures and how that affects your experience of, of seeing art. Yeah. And then you go somewhere where you're alone in a room with these masterpieces where you can just stand really close to them and be like, holy shit. Wow. It's a completely different experience. It's much more intimate and like mm, emotionally moving or, you know, you can get lost in it. Yeah. But I so you need gotta to get yeah, back to you Philly. To, gotta be, get back to the East Coast in general, but Philly should be on our next yeah. stop. And Boston. You definitely and, need to get to the barn. And Concord. <laughs> yes. New, New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> but you're up too. Yeah. I don't know what I'm waiting for. Like, I just, like, I'm such a homebody that I, like, yeah. travel is not really my strong suit. But I love it when I get, when I force myself to do it. So I just need to, like, buy it. I would ticket. think someone like you, too, where you really appreciate technical painting and, like, Renaissance painting and, like, like go, go to Amsterdam. Yeah, I you love know. the like, northern, like the Flemish, Netherlandish painters. They're, they're like my favorite. 
Yeah. Maybe I should go to Amsterdam. Amsterdam would be great. You get really high and totally eat mushrooms from a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, you can just buy psychedelic That's mushrooms. Right. It's, uh, <laughs> it sounds actually a little scary to do in a foreign <laughs> city in public. Yeah, but Amsterdam would be a perfect spot. And the Vermeers and Rembrandts. And, but I liked it a lot of the Spanish painters. So you got to go to the Prado. Yeah. And S- Spain sounds great. You went to Madrid just last year, you said? Or? We went right before the pandemic. Oh, okay. Was it before the pandemic? What, my wife's... You took the kids? You took... No. My wife's good friend got married. I'm trying to remember if this was the same trip because I went twice. I think we... No, we went before the pandemic. And we. I wanted to go to Toledo because I want to see all the El Grecos. That was like why mm-hmm. we went. <laughs> but then we went to Madrid too. So that was a special detour, El Greco Well, trip. yeah, we went to... Cause Megan knows El Greco is my favorite painter and I would be like I gotta go to Spain I gotta go to Toledo I gotta see these paintings in person and so she was like let's go to Madrid and it's not far and so we we went to Spain it was unbelievable to Prado or like Guernica it's right there you know it's in Madrid the Picasso yeah it's in Madrid yeah um one of my favorite contemporary like realist painters lives and works in Madrid. He's like 89 or something now. Antonio Lopez Garcia. Have you heard of him? No. He's like a, well, he's contemporary artist. Uh, but he's 89? Yeah. yeah. How do you That's know? That's just a guess. Work? But he's, he's like world famous for just like extremely detailed, like not detailed, but like super good perceptual painting he does like rooftop scenes of madrid just Mm. like on a rooftop painting uh he does paints figures and stuff too but he's just such a badass there's actually a movie about him like painting a tree in his backyard that some documentarian made and just shows him like mixing color and trying to like paint these quince fruits like on this tree and like wiping it away like oh it's not good enough and like doing it again and just see him paint and it's like it's really inspiring. Yeah. I saw it in a like art history class in undergrad and it just like stuck with me ever since. Isn't that so fascinating how certain things will stick with certain pe- artists other yeah. you know they're I'm sure other art kids in that class who have no idea. It's just I just remember. Yeah. We have so many blind spots. Like I see like the F- M- MCA bookstore today. Mm-hmm. I was like there's so many amazing artists out there with books like about their work, and I like don't know half these yeah. names. There's so many great artists out there, and like that's why I love collecting art books too, because you can access their art without spending like ten grand to buy a painting, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, a flat reproduction and a, a printout is of course. This comes back to the conversation we had about Instagram. It's yeah. like a reproduction. Yeah. Of a, it's a reference. Yeah. Um, how did you discover him? You discovered him in that class, and did you ever see any of them in person? Never in person. It was it was partially that class, and then uh, one of my favorite painting teachers at SAIC in undergrad, this like very uh, cranky but like hilarious Polish dude named Marian Kritschka, who's uh, just passed away this past summer. He had Parkinson's and retired uh, a few years ago. And and, uh, and then I was like actually shocked when I found out he died. Uh, uh, and it was really sad because he was yeah. only like in his mid 60s. Oh, he was young. Yeah, he wasn't that old, but the illness, I think, played a role. Totally. But he was a huge Antonio Lopez Garcia fan. He would have books of his work in the classroom. And oh, he like wow. held him up as like a uh, pinnacle of like contemporary figurative and perceptual painting. And so he turned me on to him initially. And now I like tell my students about him because I think he's amazing. So That's it's just so like, awesome. You're passing it forward. Yeah. I should really like start showing him Marion's work because he was a weird, wild guy. His work was like, he would often just like paint naked women that he just like 
invited to his studio yeah. <laughs> to pose for him. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Paint, paint them. It's like... Uh, Kevin's going to want me. Okay. He probably wants us to get over there. Hey, Farrell. I'm late. We're coming over. Yes. I'll see you soon. Bye. Shit, it's 5.30. Oh, shit. Uh, thank you so much for watching thank you for having me that was fun <laughs> thank you roger thanks for enduring my rambling questions yeah you're you're a good and, interviewer i think your uh comfort as a guest and a a interviewee made <laughs> me a better interviewer so this is like the longest podcast <laughs> it's, in, in podcast i don't think it really was we can check no, we had been going for like an hour. I think we should. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> this is a three-hour podcast. Well, with editing, I'll cut it down. It, I. You have to edit the first half hour when we were talking about Guns and Roses. <laughs> that, that wasn't even a half hour. That's like two minutes. Yeah, I can't really tell how long it is, but the clock says. Three hours and 43 minutes, but I think it's more like two hours yeah, and 43 minutes. Right. Wow. This is the longest podcast to date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like we I haven't seen all the other podcasts. four years or whatever. <laughs> How long has it been? Maybe more. When yes. were you last? I was, I think at your, no, 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 no. Because you came to Chicago in 2018. That's four years ago now. Oh, <laughs> But did I see you in New York after that? No. Not after that, no. Is that amazing how fast time goes now? Pretty wild. That is crazy. It doesn't feel that long. No. It feels like a year or two. Yeah, but like when you think about it, a lot's happened. It's just like the little like... Yeah. When you chop it up and say like, oh, the last time I saw Roger was four years ago. It's like, damn... It doesn't feel like that long, but something was a year ago. Like that also feels about the same. So time is just a mess. Time is so you, a construct. Do you remember when I first met you? You had long hair. Long. <laughs> it was probably like just like a like kind of a no, it was out. long. Oh, at that orientation? Yeah. You and Megan flew out yeah, from yeah, yeah, yeah. San Francisco to I Orient. remember I missed the flight because I got to the airport on time and I, I was really hungry. And so I got a <laughs> breakfast burrito and I sat and ate it at the San Francisco airport. And they didn't announce like, last call, come to, the air, come to your gate. So I was sitting literally like outside, not far from the gate. And they boarded everyone and then closed the door. And then I walked to the gate. I was like, I'm here. And they were like, we closed the door. Like, what are you talking about? Oh, nice. So Wait, I just you... sit. I sat there for like seven hours until the next flight. And then I flew yeah. to the orientation. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's All right. go. Want me to give you a lift over to Pilsen? If you can. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I'm like an hour late. One, two, I have double degrees in coffee. Unfortunately, the mic didn't catch that. But anyway, goodbye.